I'm Pastor Tim Holsher. I've been looking with you, if you've been sharing in our videos for the last quite a long time, 230 some videos on the Holy Spirit, but we've been looking for a less time than that on the filling of the Spirit. And I've been surveying through the letters uh, of the New Testament where it talks to us about the filling of the Spirit without that terminology. But I'm going back to one of our key passages on the filling of the Spirit, and it's Colossians 3.16. Now, if you remember from these, and if you don't, go, we can go back. I'll try to remember to put a, a link to this uh, initial video. But Colossians 3.16 does not use the word fill and does not use the word spirit. But when it says in verse 16, let the word of the Christ dwell richly in you, it then it goes through and it basically gives us the same results that you have recorded immediately following be filled by the Spirit in Ephesians 5. And it's therefore, if you remember in Ephesians 5, it's to be filled and to be filled is a passive verb. How do you fulfill a passive verb? Here I am, fill me. Is that what you do? Well, no. Colossians 3.16 has an active imperative let dwell in you richly. That is, you have to choose to, to let something dwell in you richly. And if you remember, the word of the Christ is the word about who Jesus Christ is when he shares an identity with us, the body, and he sees us together with himself, and God counts all of us to be together. It's the body is not the Christ apart from Jesus Christ. It's only when we're in connection with him that he shares this identity with us in select scriptures. And so letting the word about the Christ, let that truth dwell richly in you, this is what we do. And so we've been looking at passages that are talking to us about the body of Christ. But I thought it might be helpful for us just to come back to this this passage and think about this a little bit more about what does it mean to let that richly dwell in you. What does that mean, let it richly dwell in you? Well, we can go back here in the book of Colossians, and one of the things he says in verse 2 of chapter 2, Colossians 2, 2, he says that their hearts may be encouraged. Hearts are where you make your decision, but that your hearts might be encouraged, having been knit together in love. Now, how are they knit together in love? Well, they're knit together in love, if you go through this context, by what this is all going to come together is they're being knit together in love and unto the to the riches, here's our word rich, it's just the word riches here, not the adverb richly, unto all the riches that come from a the full assurance of understanding and fully experientially knowing the mystery of, and I, without going through the details, which I probably should take some time to explain the problem that goes on at the end of this verse, but the mystery uh, about God, and this should be God the Father, and not Jesus Christ himself, but the Christ. And what this mystery is in a nutshell is, is that you and I have a relationship in God the Father and in Jesus Christ where the Christ, we are knit together in such a way that we share in a special unity uh, that only happens when we're thinking about how we relate to the Father in Christ himself. And Jesus Christ said this himself over in John 17. This, this comes right out of some things that he said. But he says there was a mystery about it. And the mystery is Jesus Christ never revealed that we were going to be so intimately knit together with him. And he says, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In other words, you don't need to go out into the far ends of the world. You don't need to engage in, as this book is going to talk about, philosophy and things like that to try to figure this out. You just need to seek these things out and who you all are together in Christ. And when you're doing that, when you are stopping and you're thinking about this unity that you have in Christ, and you are realizing that's where the treasures are. That's where the storehouse of wisdom and knowledge is. You're letting that truth richly dwell in you. But I've known people, this has happened, in which teaching on these things, teaching on who we are in Christ, teaching on this identity, their kind of response is, yeah, I know that. I've heard that before. And you're like, oh, okay. So, so what else do you have? And I'm like, well, this is really important. Yeah, yeah, I looked into that, but I, I you know, I, I got moved on. You never move on from being in Christ. Oh, yeah, there are things you move on with, but the truth about who we all are in Christ and who we all are together in Christ, 
That's a foundational truth to practice. That is a foundational truth to how we live our Christian life. You need to understand that and you need to continue to relate to that all of your life on earth. It's a call to rest there. It's a call to remember who we are. It's a call to see ourselves and others the way God sees us. That's vital. It's not just something that's cursory that, oh, I learned that truth. I can move on to something else. Hmm, no, that's not letting this truth richly dwell in you. And we've been through some of these things, but like deception, being deceived through arguments where they try to pit one set of believers against another, perhaps intellectual believers against non-intellectual believers and such like that. Or down in verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit in accordance with human tradition, in accordance with the basic elementary principles of the world, rather than in accordance with, well, Christ, not according to Christ. Who is Christ? Christ is our identity. He's our identity individually and corporately. In fact, if we go on down here in just a little bit, he makes a statement very similar to what we have in Ephesians 2 and verse 6, or 5 and 6. It says, when you were dead by means of your, we have this word that's translated uh, uh, wrongdoings in the numeric standard, it's the word trespasses, uh, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him. Now, I want you to note over here in the Greek, I've circled uh, the beginning of a word, that's a preposition, and the same preposition is repeated here. We are made alive together with him. Now, that's with Jesus Christ. What, why is this preposition here at the beginning? Because this preposition is saying, it's not just that I personally am made alive together with Christ, but that we, all of us together, are made alive with Christ. What does rich, letting this truth richly dwell in you mean? It means that you look at other people as though they're made alive together with you. Even that believer that you are tempted to be frustrated with or to look down your nose at, to, to think that they aren't worthy of your time, whatever crazy idea you might have, to see that we're all together, all together with Christ made alive. That's letting this truth richly dwell in you. And then going down to verse 16, therefore let no one act as a judge in regard to food and drink in respect of a, a festival or a, a Jewish feast and a new moon or Sabbath. These things, he says in verse 17, these are only a shadow of what is to come. But now here in almost every translation I've looked at, they all have substance. But the word that's being translated substance is body. And it says, but the body is of Christ. And I'm just going to point this out. The King James Version, the only version, the AV is the only version I know that actually translates it, but the body is of Christ. They translate it literally. Now, all these other translations, I think they think when they say that the substance or the reality is Christ, I think they're missing their point. They think that they're actually giving you the sense, but I don't think Paul's trying to say the reality is with Christ. I think what he's saying is the body is is related to Christ. In fact, just in just a little bit after he warns them to not let anybody act as an umpire against them, calling them out with regard to certain things, he says that when they do that, in verse 19, they are not holding firmly to the head, that is to Christ, from whom the entire body. See, it's going back to focusing us on the body. And when you distinguish yourself because you're following rigid rules, because you are in doing self-imposed um, worship and things of angels and all that kind of stuff, you're not focusing on Jesus Christ, the head, and the fact that all of the body receives the supply. That's not let, that is not letting the truth of the Christ dwell richly in you. It's not. One last one before we go. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10, he says that we are to... Uh, put on, he says, be clothed with, put on the new man, the one that is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created it. See, it's called the new man because it's created just like we had over in Ephesians chapter 2, that Christ created this new man, this one new man in himself. And that's why 2 Corinthians 5.17 calls it the new creation or a new creation. And again, there is neither Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free. In other words, these 
If you look at the other people and you identify them by their race, by their racial background, by their circumcised or uncircumcised, by some religious mark, by their being cultured or uncultured, by their social status, a slave or free. However you look at those people, when you start identifying people in terms of those, and there are churches today that think they're trying to do things by reaching out to the, the disenfranchised, by trying to reach out to the to the homeless and the, and the, the people that are low within their cities and communities. And that sounds really good, but you know what they're doing? They're saying we focus on this and they shouldn't focus. They should focus on everybody. Because when you focus on any one particular group and you identify them, and then oftentimes then you have to point your finger at somebody who you think they didn't do it well enough, they didn't do the right thing, then all of a sudden you're making these divisions. But what you need to look at is whoever, whatever we might have been before we were saved, we now have our identity with Christ. But it says, but Christ is all things. He's what gives all of us now our identity and he is in all. And all of that goes back to this original statement, or it refers forward, I should say, this is looking back at all these things, letting the word of the Christ dwell richly in you. It's you thinking and relating daily to the fact that you are part of all these other people in Christ, knit together as one, part of one body, and whatever might have identified you and separated and distinguished you from all these other people, that's gone and you are now made part of that one new man. Letting that truth settle in here so that that's the way you think and see these other people and the way you relate to them. That is letting this truth richly dwell in you. Focusing on differences, focusing on Earthly things that I might do that can distinguish me from other people? That is not letting this truth rich, richly dwell in you. And Paul says, let the word of the Christ dwell richly in you. That's what we do. And as we're setting our minds, not just to who I am in Christ, but who we all are together in Christ, the Spirit fills us. And we now can function together the way he desires us to. I can play a positive role in this relationship and and I can have a good day in the Lord and you can have a good day in the Lord. We can have a good day in the Lord together. Thank you for joining me today.